The Tom Woods Show, episode 898. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, all you shavers out there, Harry's wants to send you a free trial set. Razor handle, five-blade cartridge, and shaving gel. Best shave you ever had, just pay for shipping. Check it out at harrys.com slash woods. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Toby Baxendale is back on the show. Toby is an entrepreneur who also founded the Cobden Center, which you can visit at cobdencenter.org. Center spelled in the British way, of course, with the T-R-E, which is a great libertarian website, by the way, for you to check out. Hardcore, sound, great, punchy. And he wanted to come back on to talk about Brexit, which is now actually underway, the actual process of withdrawing from the European Union is actually underway. The process is supposed to take two years. We're going to talk about that, I'm sure, in our conversation. And with it now underway, he wanted to clarify what exactly it means, because the impression that people have been given is that it means retrenchment by uh, Britain, it means isolation, it means protectionism, and he is arguing this is a complete misreading of what's happening, and I thought that was a worthy subject of discussion. Toby, welcome back. Thank you very much, Tom, for having me back. I've spoken to a lot of people from the UK who are libertarians, and generally, as you might expect, they were in favor of Brexit. But I I did get a minority view among some of them who seemed to feel that maybe the whole project of Brexit was being a bit oversold, that it was being promised as a great liberation, when in fact all it meant was that now we're going to be subject to the equally crummy or perhaps crummier UK bureaucrats, and it's not so clear that as a practical matter, this is something to cheer. What's wrong with that way of thinking? Well, that, it, that's a very interesting thought process, and I, have, I do have a lot of sympathy with it, uh, of, of course, but I think what we must um, always, always bear in mind in this is that getting rid of one large uh, layer of government, and particularly a, a um, sort of gigantic elephant, and tight, you know, bureaucratic, um, sluggish, um, you know, edifice, BMOs that uh, the European Union was. That's a good, good thing, and that should be thoroughly welcomed. And yes, it will mean we'll um, get our um, own bureaucrats back, um, you know, uh, do, do, doing the various um, things. But let's face it, you know, we had um, many, many uh, centuries, if not millennia, of um, of um, continuous history um, running under our own um, devices, um, with only 43 years uh, running under the European uh, under the European Union, and um, you know I I think we've got a better track record out, outside it. So yes, um, we of course we are just going to be r- ruled by our own um, our own people and our own, own, own bureaucrats, our own elected politicians. But it's it's a it's a damn sight better. Let me tell you than being run by virtually unaccountable people um, in distant lands. Now, let me tell you the interpretation of Brexit that's been placed on it by a lot of people, a lot of Americans, maybe a lot of people in the UK, for all I know, that I know you want to do something to overturn. And that's the view that Brexit means a return to isolation. It means uh, the adoption of protectionist measures. It, It means a revulsion against the free market itself. Now that is a view that a lot of people have. Where where is it going wrong? And and but there are people who believe that though in the UK. You know there are. And and and, and Tom, that that is if you if you read um, the metropolitan elite press, um, and if you look li- listen to the regular media channels, then you know if you if you're a Brexiteer, you're a swivelied swivelied lunatic, xenophobe, um, little Englander. Um, so that's. A quick way to sum up what you've, uh, the, you know, the view that you've just I- I expressed there, and um, and the reality is there were there were there were two um, strains of of thought in 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 the Brexit debate. There are those people, are Little Englanders and isolationists, um, and and xenophobic, um, and they're centred around the people like Nigel Farage, who's who's an extremely good publicist. Um, and leader of, uh, he was leader at the time of the UK Independence Party, um, and um, you know he's seen cavorting as the first UK politician over with um, President-elect Donald Trump. Um, but that's a that is a very much a minority view of 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 the Brexiteers. 
the official leave campaign um, was was run by people who would describe themselves as, as, as largely broadly speaking conservative politicians, but of the libertarian bent in American language or classical liberals in European language or even Whigs um, from the, 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 old, the old Whig party that predate, predates the Liberal Party here. Um, and that was the official campaigning designation was run by the people looking for very much an open Britain and a Britain that is in fact not stuck in a protectionist um, trade body which the European Union was, but w worse than that, I mean, to a certain extent, uh, the protectionist trade body of being able to at least free trade within your own borders of 28 countries, you know, is not a bad thing. It's still a protectionist block, and from a free market perspective, we, we must still resist it. Um, but but um, from a really, 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 really dangerous uh, situation developed over the last um, decade and a half where ever closer political union became the mantra of, uh, of, of formerly what was called the European Economic Union. So people who thought they were getting involved in a free trade zone, albeit uh, only in the 28 member states, it soon became a political project. And you see, the people who ran the official Leave campaign are uh, all people who do not want anything whatsoever to do with that uh, political, um, grand, grandiose political project. Um, or, or, of creating, you know, a, a European empire that can, um, you know, hold its own against the, the Chinese and against the Americans and sort of power block politics. We have no interest in that. And um, the people who actually won um, the, uh, the, the the whole Brexit um, issue are, are out and out free traders, and they're looking for an open and engaging Britain. And, and remember, Britain has a great history in this, um, being you know, at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, leading free trade around the world, and you know, particularly the likes of Richard Cobden and, and, uh, and, and Bright, um, the Cobden Chevalier Act of 1860, giving unilateral free trade, setting the example to the world. And we, you know, we know what that did to um, boost the Industrial Revolution. So my point to your American audience, Tom, is, is we're often now I'm seeing being compared with um, Le Penites and Trumpites um, who are out and out protectionists. They're, they're exactly diametrically opposed to, 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 to what you're going to see as a, resu as, as a result of Brexit, you know, which, will, which will be a, a, a liberalization of trade across the globe for this country. And we're in, I classify it Tom, as, a, as an unfrozen moment, or I describe it as an unfrozen moment when you, when when the tectonic plates of politics and economics, you know, are just uh, you've got a window to move them um, and move them quite for a far, quite a big distance, and then they'll freeze up again for you know several decades. Uh, this is it. So it's actually a it's actually a victory uh, for for the free trade classical liberal stroke libertarian position. You know, and it, it's never going to be ideal uh, for everybody, and you know, purists. Um, who we know, we know a number of will, you know, still have a moan that it's not, um, you know, true unilateral free trade and so on and so forth. And no doubt there'll be little deals done here and little deals done there. But it's a, it's a significant move um, in the right direction that should be welcomed. All right, let me ask you this because I I'd love to believe that what you're telling me is the case, and I have no reason not to believe it. But yet we hear so much to the contrary here. Free trade in the U.S. is actually not all that popular. If you look at opinion polls, they're really it's yeah. really not. People don't really understand it. They think it's actually harming their standard of living. Mm. And I, what I wonder is if even if the official people, let's say, who were running the Leave campaign were libertarians and free traders, that doesn't mean that's why the average Joe voted to leave. Do you have any poll data that shows that the people who voted to leave were not voting for a little England, but they were voting for a free and open England with free trade? Well, unfortunately, Tom, the message that then has, gets out to the media and, and what the media um, you know, campaign on, and I think what a lot of people, what a pe what a lot of people then voted on were, you know, we don't we don't like um, the immigrants' automatic use of the national health service. Uh, we don't we we don't like um, all the public services being put on put, put under significant stress because we've got three million um, people from the European Union um, stressing out the public public services. 
So yes, there, 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 there was a lot of that. And, they, and, and a significant portion of those people, those, those people were, were voting for those kind of reasons. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say racist reasons. Uh, they're, just, they're just pointing out that you know, when they go to the doctor's surgery and they can't get seen, you know, then, and they see, uh, they, they see a load of Poles and a load of Romanians and a load of Bulgarians in, in there. They're just they're doing two plus two equals five. And that's just, that's the kind of conclusions they come to. And yes, the bottom the bottom line is a lot of people did vote as uh, as you said, but a lot of people, you know, did vote as well. You know, remember that the official Leave campaign was always we're going to be going for a, for, for free trade agreements around the world, and they did vote for that as well. But it's never um, it's never it's never really raised as an issue because it's not quite it's not quite as newsworthy. You know, when you can run, you know, a, a horrible um, immigration story um, in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the red top newspapers, which gets you headlines uh, rather than a, more, a, a kind of, you know, run a story about the law of comparative advantage um, and, and how, you know, it's going to be free trade is going to be good actually for all um, participants in, uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom. So that's where it all got lost. Um, in, in the more public debates, but bottom line is the official Leave campaign did run on that agenda and, you know, it did get over the line, as we know, 52%. Isn't it the case that in the European Union, they already favoured free trade? So doesn't this seem like a, a real subtle point to expect the average voter to get? Well, we still want to maintain free trade, but we just want to make our own decisions about it. I mean, surely something else must have been driving Brexit. Oh yeah, no, something, something, something was Tom. But I'll just go back to the to the to the first point of that. Yeah, if you if you speak to someone, um, mainstream European, you know, po- uh, politician, they will wax lyrical that in in the European Common Market Area itself, you know, the the twenty eight the twenty eight nations, you can move your goods wherever you like, be it you know mechanical goods intellectual uh, property be it yourself you can move around there to- totally freely and that is correct yeah and they will say well this is the ultimate free tra- this is the ultimate free trade model but of course it isn't yeah because you've got huge protectionist barriers um wrapping around wrapping around around the um the whole of the whole, whole of the 28 which is an, an anti the poor primarily because the interests that are, prote- are protected are invariably inefficient agriculture so you've got whole swathes of, uh, of people you're discriminating against. Farmers around the world, you know, in, in, the, in, in the poor, poor nations who cannot, who cannot send their, their produce into, uh, in, into the European Union. So you, you're forcing your citizens as well to pay higher prices. So yes, they, 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 they say on the one hand they're, they're free traders, but they're not. You know, they, they can't be. They're free traders for their own, for their own little club. Yeah, but that's it. It's kind of sod you for the rest of the world, which is not, you know, an, an open um, and an, an engaging uh, way to be. And this is the thing that's very, very frustrating because they'll quite happily call the little Englander Brexiteers uh, xenophobic when they're, ult- they're ultimately zen- zen- xenophobic. They're, it's, a, it's a European uh, elite club that works for itself. Yeah, but it doesn't work for it doesn't work well. It works to itself to a certain extent, but as, as you know, ultimately it will impoverish its own its own people because it's not letting them buy, you know, American beef, for example, from more efficient American uh, far- farmers. It's not not letting um, you buy grain um, from you know from the Ukraine uh, or from Paraguay or from Australia or, you know, or or from any you know any anywhere any any produce. Um, coming out of Africa without paying huge, great big tariffs. So that's um, where it's free trade to a point. Yeah, uh, is, 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 is the European, European Union. And then, yes, um, going back to your you know, question about what was, what was driving Brexit. Now, what was driving Brexit? The real, real, um, you know, reasons why the, four, why the 42, or why the uh, 52 were, were so, um, so motivated, you know, it's one of the highest electoral turnouts we've ever had in, in, in living memory, it was because the, the, the elite have disengaged 
the the global internet, international elite have disengaged and left these people left these people behind. You know, if you're a steel worker in Sunderland, yeah, and you see in the city of London a man earning six hundred thousand pounds a year or a million pounds a year, and he's working for a bank that's owned by the taxpayer, yeah, and he's been bailed out. Uh, the, ba- the whole ba- the whole money and banking system, which we know has in effect been all bailed out and subsidised by the taxpayer, you may not su- you may not be sophisticated to know why that's happened, but you know, as that steel worker who's been having his job threatened, his job threatened, yeah, uh, you know you are being ripped off, yeah, you'll know you're being ripped off, and you know it's always the elites manage to line their own pockets and manage to survive, and that's why they voted Tom. That's why there's a, that why there was a huge out, out, outturning. And it's in all the poorer areas, in the coal, coal mining areas of Wales, the, the uh, old steel places up, up in the north of England and in, in, in the Midlands. You know, they, ca- they came out and they revolted against the elites because the elites have, the elites, um, have seemed to have lined their pockets at the, expense of, at the expense of the majority of the people. That is the real, real ultimate reason why people have voted brexit yes the free i I love to think that you know we had a mass of free trade um people of 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 course i would it was important but it wasn't the it wasn't the be you know the the be all and the end all the the be all and the end all is the disconnection between the bits between between largely the southern largely london-based um metropolitan elite and the rest of the nation and that's it in a nutshell We'll continue this conversation after we thank our sponsor. Folks, I am here not just to educate, but also to improve your life in innumerable ways. And one ingredient in a happy life has to be a non-bloody face. In fact, now that I think about it, I can't think of any happy lives that involve bloody faces. Come on now, man. One of the things you want is a comfortable, close shave that makes you look great. That doesn't make you look like a caveman who found some kind of sharp thing on the ground and rubbed it against his face. So that's why I'm very happy to share with you my excellent experiences with Harry's razors. I get close shaves, non-bloody shaves, and I am a happy man. And look, Harry's is making it easy on listeners of this show to get started because they're going to send you a free trial set. That's a 13-smacker value. So get cracking today. Claim that free trial offer over at harrys.com slash woods. That's a razor handle, five-blade cartridge, and shave gel. harrys.com slash woods, and grab it. All right, Toby, let's talk a little bit about free trade itself here, because free trade seems to me to be a hard thing to defend for this reason. When we think about public choice analysis, we think about, for example, why there would be quotas on oranges when that only benefits the orange growers. It doesn't benefit the public Mm. at large. But Mm. then you realize, well, the reason that they get the quotas is that they're a concentrated group and they enjoy the concentrated benefit that, so to speak, that comes from orange uh, quotas. Whereas I, as a consumer of orange juice, am suffering only very slightly from a very slight increase in the price of oranges, yeah. and I'm very disorganized with all my other – my fellow consumers of orange juice. We're not going to get together and fight that. wouldn't be worth our time. So the concentrated benefit to the concentrated interest group tends to win out. It looks to me, though, like free trade is the mirror image of that because free trade is a case where instead of the – pain being spread out and the benefits are concentrated, the pain is concentrated and the benefits are spread out. So the average person is enjoying a tiny little benefit all the time every time trade is expanded. His mm. prices go slightly down, but but slightly, mm. and they probably don't know why their prices are going down. But what they do know is the lumber industry is suffering. The steel industry is suffering. They mm. see the concentrated pain. And mm. so, for example, in the U.S., we just were reading news that The president wants to put tariffs on some forms of Canadian lumber. Mm. Now, the average person might think, well, I don't care anything about about lumber, and maybe that helps some Americans. But when their house price goes up, they won't make the connection. The the, the pain they feel, they won't make the connection. But they'll see the concentrated pain of – and therefore the concentrated benefit that these people get from protectionism. 
Mm. So you see what I mean? It's a hard thing to sell because we're selling them on benefits that are dispersed and nonspecific. And yet they can turn around and talk about – point to very specific pain points of industries that suffer from free trade. How do we overcome that? Well, uh, Tom, you've, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, it's very, very perceptive of you. But the, the, only thing I, the only thing I think it, – it's incumbent upon us people who know a little bit about economics to not, um, not kind of just you know, give up. At that um, at that problem, but to, but to say yes, you know the lum- the lumber industry, presumably it's the Canadian lumber industry has um, you know a comparative advantage over over the American lum- lum- lumber industry. Um, Donald Trump is, uh, is uh, am I right in saying I, he's put um, a tariff up against um, instantaneously against the the Canadian lumber industry? Is that why you mentioned it? Yes, that's what it looks like. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Okay. Well, you know, it goes back to in the doctor's surgery, the doctor can, he can do the receptionist job very easily. He's an educated person, he or she, um, they, 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 could, they could get rid of the receptionist and they have an absolute advantage over, 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 over the receptionist, but they will treat less patients. Yeah. So who, 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 who loses? The community loses. Now I don't know, Tom, but maybe we just need to maybe we just need to bring it back down to real local um, I- examples of, of of where comparative advantage always works. Yeah, so you can understand it in your community, you can understand it in your daily life, because each and every single one of you, and one of us in the whole of society, always operates to the law of comparative advantage. We do that in our families, we do that in our workplaces. So maybe a ground up approach. You know, will then will then we be able to say, well, you know, actually in the the, the lumber industry, that particular exa- particular example, if we start if we start um, trading on our absolute advantages, we'll be like the the doctor in taking the receptionist job. And at the end of the day, we'll treat less people, and that is what will be the will, will be the end result. Yeah, and and we've got to be confident enough to keep on keep on giving out this message. And fighting and fighting these uh, these these protectionist tariffs because all, sadly all, all Canada's going to do at some point in time if it gets a few more of these it will erect a load of tariffs against the the, 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 the people of the uh, of the USA and then they will start feeling it yeah and you know how that goes these right. pathetic um, you know spirals of tra- uh, tra- trade wars and tariffs so yes you lose the argument in the moment but I think we've got to get it really really, really back to Billy Basics. Um, and so people can relate. People have got to be able to relate to it in their daily lives. Um, that's how I think you can you can present the free trade argument better. Now, my understanding is it's going to take another two full years before Brexit is fully carried out. Am I right about that? Yes. Well, it's, cu- it's curious. It's Article Fifty of the Lib- Lis- Lisbon Treaty, and um, yes, we we've uh, got well twenty three months left now. Um, now, officially, we can't negotiate with anybody. Yeah, anybody. We're still governed by um, our membership rules of the of the European Union, um, so we can't actually. So even if Donald Trump, you know, knocked on our door tomorrow and said, "Hey guys, let's do a free trade agreement," we technically can't talk to you um, until after the um, after March um, March 2019, um, which me- which means we'll be coming out of one set of rules, and then you know on. On day one, we're then supposed to then start negotiating with the rest of the world. Now, I think people are going to be sensible and practical about this and know that uh, that uh, the UK has to actually start thinking about its post-March 2019 existence um, and will hopefully be, uh, you know, allowed to um, uh, negotiate, um, you know, external agreements. But the European Union at the moment are playing quite hardball because they're talking they're talking about money issues first because being a member of the club you obviously owe subscriptions um so there's a big argument about well you owe this and uh, you know the european union is saying i'm quoting a kind of 50 million euro figure 50 billion sorry i beg your pardon figure or it might even be 60 billion and we think it might be about you know 10 or 15 billion and then there's of course all our all, all the share of um the assets that we own um in the whole european infrastructure um, in the in the in the various European countries, which we are saying is worth, I don't even know if they put a figure on it, but it's a, you know a big number in many billions. So there's 
dancing around the handbags going on, deciding who owes what to what to whom, that's got to get done first, and then they'll start talking turkey with us um, about what type of specific um, disengagement agreements we will have. Um, and hopefully at that point we can say, well, and we want to be given, um, you know, good, good grace to go and negotiate um, some free trade agreements because they do take some time. What is the reason behind the, the, this provision that you would need this two-year delay? Well, it is, it, well, it, well, the reason you would have thought it, it is precisely so that you can line up your, um, you know, your, your soft landing. Right, and um, they won't let you do it. No. No, it's, uh, it's you can't talk to anyone because you're still a member. Uh, you're still a member, therefore you're bound by the member's rules. And, you know, and when you become a member, you cede all your negotiating ability on external, external arrangements with other countries to, to, to the European Union. So it's, it's one of those awkward ones. But, I, you know, I, just, I, pr- I pray and I, I do genuinely pray that uh, people will just, politicians will get out the way, you know, and, uh, you know all this uh, kind of ego will get out the way and uh, it'll, it'll be sensible because bottom line is Tom, just like you want Canada and you want Mexico to be good, healthy neighbors. You know, we want European, the European uh, union to be a good, healthy neighbor to us as I hope they want us to be a good, healthy neighbor to them. So hopefully reason will prevail, but you know, politicians, um, they, they tend to disappoint, don't they? Did you have any final thoughts on this issue that we haven't covered before we wrap up for today? Well, I just like, I, I, I would just like to say, you know, to, to, to your American audience, we did a truly fantastic, uh, you know, miraculous thing on, on the 23rd of June of last year, 2016. And it is a, it is a victory for, uh, for, op- for open and free trade. And when I see, when I see, you know, you in a, in a, in a very difficult uh, political situation with a protectionist, with a protectionist, um, President, um, that you you do you derive a lot of cur- you should derive a lot of courage from us um, that we can um, you know build a better uh, a, a better world based on the on the principles of being open and, and 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 free and trading with each other and I just hope there's enough Americans in there who who will um, you know really really fight the fight. Well, of course, I hope so too, and I I'm glad you wrote to me. But next time we have to meet on a platform other than Twitter, though, uh, but because <laughs> the direct messages on Twitter, I never think to do. I'm not I'm not as savvy on Twitter as I ought to be. But but anyway, I'm glad you you wrote to me because it turns out that I had been laboring under, you know, at least a partial misconception on, about the nature of Brexit and what it was all about. And I'm glad to hear that the Toby Baxendale version of Brexit is more likely the correct one than the Nigel Farage one. And I mean, I, I kind of like Nigel Farage just because I, I like the way he presents himself. I like, I don't agree with him all the time, but mm. he's a tough cookie and he, he's charismatic and, and I, I go for those things and he has the right enemies. And sometimes I draw some conclusions from that, but all those things can be said about you times a thousand. So I'm glad that it's the backs and Dalians who are carrying the day. Uh, Best of luck uh, just continuing to spread the word there. We certainly appreciate it. Well, that's very kind of you, Tom. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, I really, really hope, hope for you guys. I hope and, and, I, and I pray that, um, that we, can, we can get a, an, an open and free trade agreement with you, with you in America. That would be glorious. Yeah, I, there's absolutely no reason for that not to happen. So, yeah, but of course, <laughs> you could say that about a lot of things and they yeah. find a reason. But anyway, thanks a lot, Toby. Appreciate it. Yeah, cheers then, Tom. Thank you very much. God bless. All right, that's going to do it for us for today. Tomorrow, if all goes well, we are going to talk about the Armenian genocide, which is a topic I've had many requests for, and uh, your wish is my command. So expect that on episode 899, and I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.